Hello and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran shaking your fist at the heavens over a 75-cent royalty check from Google, or else a scrappy upstart thinking this really could be the night that the head of Columbia Records walks into the open mic night at your local bar and grill, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey guys, before we get started today, I just want to thank everyone who came out to the Australian tour this month, and I want to thank our promoter, BT, who pretty much single-handedly keeps great American songs alive down in Australia. So thank you, BT. Thank you to everyone that came to the concerts. It was great spending a couple weeks with Robert Ellis and his band. Uh, Between shows, we actually brainstormed heavily in the van uh, about a possible side project that we have tentatively entitled Three Chords in the Truthers, wherein we combine like hard on the sleeve acoustic ballads with Alex Jones level conspiracy theories. Uh, just very earnest acoustic music about Operation Jade Helm, the Bilderberg Conference the downsides of vaccination. Um, so keep your eye out uh, for that in your wherever you stream and purchase music because uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to put that together in, in a very, very sad and dark way, uh, probably uh, earn ourselves the largest audience we've ever had before, uh, given from what I can tell of uh, the current climate in our country right now. Um, but until we put that project together... You should come catch a concert of mine, which I promise will be 100% free of uh, conspiracy theories. I'll be in Greensboro, North Carolina on November 11th, Atlanta on November 13th, Tampa on the 14th, Tallahassee on the 15th, Jacksonville on November 17th, Gainesville on November 18th. Uh, Then in December, I'll be in St. Paul, Minnesota on the 1st. Evanston, Illinois on the 2nd for an early and late show, and Indianapolis on the 3rd, which will close out my live calendar for the year. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, there's a couple quick, painless, entirely free things that you can do to help out. Uh, Both of these things you can do from your smartphone. First, You could rate the show or leave a review in your podcast app. You just open the app, search for the show, click on the review button, and you're good to go. It's very quick. Uh, Or the second thing that you could do, also from your phone, is simply share the episode with like-minded friends who you think might dig it. That's just as easy within your podcast app. You just click on that little square with the arrow coming out of the top and it'll open up a menu for you to text it or email it or whatever to people who you think might uh, jump on the train. That's it, I think. That's all the harassment that I have for you. And I really hope you guys enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed putting it together. summer of 1976, Casey Chambers was raised in a vast, unpopulated expanse of Western Australia, known as the Nullarbor Plain, a region of almost unparalleled earthly isolation. So it's fitting that she would go on to be widely and affectionately known as the queen of Australian country music. She grew up singing covers in a family band headed by her father, Bill Chambers, 
a now notable guitarist and producer in his own right. Her debut album in 1999, The Captain, was an instant and widespread success in Australia. The eponymous single was featured over the closing credits of an episode of The Sopranos, which put her on the cult favorite map here in the U.S. Her first five albums all achieved platinum status in Australia, including her sophomore album, Barricades and Brick Walls, which went seven times platinum. She is recorded for EMI, Warner Brothers, and Sugar Hill Records, She has been nominated for and won a bevy of arias, which are the Australian Grammys. She's appeared on The Tonight Show, NPR's Mountain Stage, and A Prairie Home Companion. Rolling Stone has said, There are few more intuitive songwriters than Casey Chambers. The AV Club has noted that she possesses the remarkable ability to weave sharp wit with lyrics that touch on loss and desperation. And maybe most presciently, American songwriter has warned us, sorry America, we're behind the curve on Casey Chambers. Casey and I caught up last week during my tour of Australia in Sydney at the Adena Hotel. Will you take me back to, is it pronounced the Nullarbor? Playing? The Nullarbor. The yeah, Nullarbor Yeah, but you play. can say however you want. I like it with your accent. Okay, <laughs> so with my accent, we're going to go back to the uh, the Nullarbor Plain in South Australia. Yeah, it's You're... actually Latin for no trees, and that's what it's like out there. Really? It is just no trees. It's like just red dirt and salt bush, and you can see, you can literally see for hundreds of miles. Like it's so flat. Unreal. Yeah, it's it's really incredible. Like when I think of... My childhood, that is the main thing that comes flooding to my mind is Mm. just that outback. It's, you know, it's such a raw part of Australia. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Have you driven through the American Southwest before? No, I haven't. Not not really. Not not like... I wonder how it would compare. Yeah. Uh, In my mind, that's what I'd see. But I think Americans and people from, not from Australia, don't really understand the vastness and, and how you know, parts of Australia are just unpopulated. Do you know what? A lot of Australians don't even know that. When I right. talk about my childhood here, even to Australians, the, I don't, I mean, most of our population is on the East Coast mm-hmm. and that's most of where we tour as well. Like mm-hmm. a lot of bands come over here and they only tour the, the um, East Coast. We go everywhere, <laughs> you know, anywhere where they'll have us, we tour every, everywhere in Australia. But a lot of Australians have never even seen the the sort of area, the sort of outback and the barren place that I grew up. <laughs> it's very strange. <laughs> Unreal. Just to give people an idea, I heard, and this might be anecdotal, but when I first <laughs> toured over here five or six years ago, I heard that in certain parts you had to carry your own gas because their gas stations were too far apart yeah. to, for you to get yeah. through. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you can drive right across the middle of the Nullarbor. So you can pretty much go from east to west, west to east, you know, um, and you are driving straight through the middle of the Nullarbor Plain and it is outback, outback. But where we used to live, you know, was, you know, out in that area, but then even more outback as in sometimes we were not even on roads. My dad was driving cross country um, like via the stars or via the compass or whatever. He's like oh. not even on roads at It's almost all. like in a way sailing. Yeah, yeah. My It was God. incredible, yeah. I mean, my dad was a, he was a professional fox hunter, which sounds, <laughs> I know, I get the weirdest looks from people when I say that. And it's so weird because I was about three weeks old and my dad packs up the whole family, my older brother Nash and my mum and myself, and he packs us all up. He moves us into our car, right? So we had what, uh, what they call a Toyota Land Cruiser. And my dad made bunks in the back of the car for us all to sleep in, live in. Then he drives us out to the most remote area in the whole of Australia. 
And we literally lived there for the next 10 years while my dad hunted foxes for a living. Isn't that crazy? All I can think of is your mom is a very game woman oh to, to go with that oh, plan. Man. Well, That's I mean, crazy. with a three-week-old baby as well. Wow. I mean, you know what it's like to have yeah. a, a new little baby. And you're like, I mean, to, wow. for me, when I had my, <laughs> like, well, all three of my children, at three weeks old, I barely made it to the supermarket without getting overwhelmed and having to turn around and go back home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so my mum has packed up this family, the three-year-old little boy and a three-week-old little baby girl, and off they go to live in the remote, air, most remote area of Australia. And hunt foxes. And hunt foxes and live off the land. Like we, because there's no shops, like you say, there was no, you know, no service station to get, get your um, petrol and... And the only time we would see other people is every few weeks we would get our supplies from the tea and sugar train. So there's like the train um, that that runs across there and it's like a little grocery store. You just walk on and, and you've got your little um, – your basket and you fill up your basket with all your, <laughs> all your supplies. Yeah, and then fill up our car and then we'd head back out back. And that was the only time we saw people. So you would basically drive to sort of a depot wherever this thing would stop or yeah. just a prearranged place and they would basically open up the sides of it and say, here, you can buy your milk and bread. Or Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And the rest of it, I mean, we would hunt our own food really because we lived off eating rabbits and kangaroos and wild bush turkey and all these crazy <laughs> You're looking at me like so strange. Right? No, it's no, so no. interesting. It is strange. I mean, I even tell my musician friends this or pe- other people that have grown up in Australia their whole lives and they think we're pretty bloody mad too. So, <laughs> Well, so, but this leads to my next question very nicely because I'm always interested in what people were exposed to musically early. So, um, and... So obviously your dad had a band for the longest time, the Dead Ringers, Bill Chambers. So was the only music that you were exposed to what your dad was literally playing for you? Or did you have tapes or did you have radio? Both. So no, we had tapes and and what my dad would play to me around the campfire. So Mm. on sundown, a lot of the nights we would sit around the campfire. My dad would bring out the guitar and we'd all sing together as a family or my dad would play us songs, you know. And he would um, play tapes as well while we were driving along each night hunting. <laughs> so he'd play, he'd play tapes. Stop and- <laughs> right there. The hunting goes on at night? Yeah. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's even deeper. So I know. It's crazy. <laughs> so we would, what we would do is like just after the sun had gone down, we would pack up the camp and mm-hmm. everyone pile in the car mm-hmm. and then we'd drive through the night, my dad would hunt while we're driving along. And then, you know, the certain time would come along and I would get into my bunk in the back of the car. My brother would get into his bunk. We'd go off to sleep. Yeah. Then my mum would go off to sleep, but my dad would keep hunting through the night. So I, every night I would fall asleep in a moving car oh, every man. night. And my dad was still playing music in the car. So we would fall asleep with you know, Hank playing or Johnny Cash or um, Graham and Emmy Lou, the mm-hmm. Carter family, that kind of thing. And it was mostly all American country music mm-hmm. that my dad had, well, he'd been brought up listening to Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family, that kind of thing. So then he was automatically sort of influenced by then that, that next generation mm-hmm. of, of Graham and Emmy Lou and all that. And then I started getting into music on my own and started discovering Steve Earle and Lucinda Williams. But how did like you that. even get onto music on your own? Had you guys moved to a more uh, populated area at that point or had you? Eventually. Yeah. I mean, we, we, this, you know, I mean, the, around the campfire, a lot of that was just f- in, within that first 10 years of my life. Mm-hmm. And then for a few months of every year, so we would hunt each night. Um, we, we would head out, go, you know, hunting for the night and then we'd all go to sleep. Mm-hmm. My dad would find some random camp wherever he was. So yeah. every morning that we woke up, we were in a new place that I'd never, ever seen before. Every single day. It God, was wild. perfect training for your future it uh, profession. It really is. I mean, I, yeah. I think of it like my backyard. My backyard was different every single day and it was just so exciting. You know, my brother and I would wake up and go, what are we going to explore? What are we going to find today? You yeah. Know? And it's, it was really inspiring, you know. It sounds like it. Yeah. And So when did you start playing with your dad's band, The Dead Ringers? 
Well, we kind of moved back to civilization around when I was like nine, ten, around that age. And we started playing um, in our kind of local area. And then we started traveling away a little bit. And we started traveling around Australia, playing in just pubs, you know, cover gigs, wherever they mm-hmm. would have us sort of thing. As a family, we couldn't afford hotel rooms or anything like that. Right. So we just took um, a swag, like a, I don't know, you guys call it a bedroll, maybe? Like yeah, a, yeah, or a yeah. sleeping bag. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like a sleeping bag and a bedroll all in one. Gotcha. It's one thing, you know. Okay. And then you, you fold it up. And, and a lot of campers in Australia use swags. Yeah. So we had like um, a bunch of swags and we would just travel to a town and we'd set up camp outside of the town yeah. and we'd sleep under the stars, you know, we'd go to a truck stop and have a shower and freshen up and then go play our gig and then come back out and go to sleep in the swag. And God, <laughs> I mean, what you're describing right now just sounds like uh, 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 just the fictional bio of some Americana uh, <laughs> uh, singer-songwriter starting out right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm but a little really bit spoiled now. I don't yeah. think I could go back to that now. Particularly no. when I'm dragging three kids along on the road. With right me on. Now I'm like, I don't want to stay in that swag under the stuff. Right on. <laughs> I'm spoiled. And were you uh, were you singing original songs with your dad, or was it mostly covers when you guys were playing out? It was mostly covers, really. Um, we had a few originals. I mean, up until that point, I guess my biggest female mo- role model in music was. Emmy Lou Harris, right on. and she didn't write a lot of her songs back then. Right, she played a lot of covers. Um, so I hadn't, re- I guess I just hadn't really explored the songwriting side of things in my early years. I just thought songs existed. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, they're just there. And and Emmy Lou has such a beautiful way of making every song sound like hers anyway. Well, you know, so I didn't yeah. I didn't really need to know who wrote them. They mm-hmm. were her songs in in my eyes. Um and then when I was about 13 or 14, something like that, my dad took me to see Roseanne Cash in concert. Right on. And I was really excited about that. You know, we... Where was that? That was in Adelaide. In Adelaide, okay. Um, And we spent a lot of time around that area. And this was... um, This was in my mid-teens, you know. I guess Mm -hmm. it was a fairly impressionable time. And and I also... I'd gone through this time of, like, you know, one day I would you know, be listening to Emily Harris and then the next day I'd be listening to Metallica because I knew my dad hated it, you know. Right on, <laughs> yeah. So right I on. went through that normal teenage stage yeah. where I was like, oh, you know, I just like anything that my dad hates, you know. <laughs> right on, yeah. And then he took me to see Roseanne Cash and then there were these two ladies on this show that I had never heard of before, Lucinda Williams and Mary Shapen Carpenter. God, and I was America. just like... I just remember Lucinda coming out and she didn't really say anything. She just started playing these songs and I was – like I literally changed my life. I just decided from that moment on I was a songwriter. So I was just – it was no longer about singing songs and just interpreting what lyrics someone else had written. Yeah. I needed to write. A song, and I, I'd never really even thought about it before. And I woke up the next morning and wrote my first song. It was terrible. It's the worst song. I ever love heard, that though. You know, like uh, that is my. I think the biggest compliment that someone can give you after a show is you talk to them later and they say, "I loved your show. I went straight home and started writing." Yeah, that's a great compliment to get because um, well, you've I inspired find them. Other yeah. songwriters do that to me. You do that to me right. every time I see you play live or get your newest album or something. You know, <laughs> but I do get really inspired by other songwriters, and that was that pivotal moment with Lucinda. Yeah, was just like she she became my biggest female mo- role model in music mm. from that moment on, and still is. You know, mm. still inspires me yes. a lot. Um, but that was a real that that was the moment of going okay. This is a is now about putting my heart on my sleeve. Yes, yes, indeed. So you decide to write these songs, and you get ready to make your first album, your debut, The Captain. Take me through the process of what it was like to make that album. How did you get signed? How did it get put out? Just kind of walk me through the story of how that debut happened. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a crazy time to think back on now. At, at the time, I didn't think too much about it. I, I was 
I had always had a few songs saved up that I didn't end up putting on Dead Ringer Band albums, which was the family band, my mum and dad and my brother and myself, you know, mm-hmm. and we, we made a bunch of albums and I wrote some songs that ended up on those albums. But there were a few songs that along the way I just felt like were very me and not, not the band and they just didn't end up on any of those albums. So I think in my mind I always knew that I would make a record one day, a solo album. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that it would be when it was because I, um, my mum and dad, their marriage broke down. So Mm. they split up and I was, it was kind of at this point where all I had ever known was the Dead Ringer Band to be, you know, I'd left school and, and gone um, out on the road. Oh, so you, you left school to go on the road? I left school, road. yeah, quite quite early, like in my sort of early teens. Right on. And, yeah, and we went on the road and, and I was out doing that. I mean, for a little while I, I tried to do a bit of both, but I was never really into school and, um, yeah, I think, I think my mum and dad knew that I was probably <laughs> – and my heart was out on the road, you know, yeah. and so we were out touring and doing all that. But – yeah, that once that marriage broke down between my mum and dad, it really stopped the band, obviously. You, you know? think so? <laughs> <laughs> Which is weird. No, they're, they're both still on tour with me now. So they're not um, married now, but they both tour with me and they're the best of friends. That's so great. So we kind of turned it around and that they've been just awesome role models as, as humans, mm-hmm. <laughs> but also musically, you know. Um, but it was really then that I went, okay... I have to either make a solo album or I have to go out and get a day job. No, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it was a no-brainer. <laughs> I didn't have to think about that very long. I mean, particularly because I also don't really have any other skills. <laughs> I know. It's a back-against-the-wall yeah, type yeah, of thing exactly. for some of us. So yeah. I went, okay, you know, I'll make a solo album. But I really wanted everyone to be involved and they were. Um, you know, we I made the album with my brother producing and he'd never really produced anything before either a little bit of the dead ringer band stuff but mm-hmm. he wanted to go more into that world mm-hmm. of production and just generally behind the scenes mm-hmm. um he wasn't loving being on stage he never did but um so when you say production is your brother in there arranging the songs is he pushing the faders is he hiring people what is he doing a bit of both or, yeah. yeah he was sort of learning how to work a studio learning how to engineer um from a good friend of ours who had engineered some of our stuff in the past and um but he it was really all about um shaping songs and and helping create them come to life and he was mm. really you know i could tell that even early on that that's where his heart was you could just tell he i recognized in him that when he helped shape a song in the studio it gave him that same look on his face that i have when i'm on stage performing them and i was like okay that's his thing this is my thing this is his thing yes. and we can make this work you mm-hmm. know as a combination and then my dad's thing was you know just he just wants to play guitar that's right all he on. cares about give me a dobro give me a guitar give me a lap steel i'm happy just wants know? to hunt foxes <laughs> and play guitar that's it bill is good <laughs> He's happy as long yeah. as he's doing that. He and he's still in my band now. Yeah, and still just played on my latest record. Yeah, and he played on the captain, and he's a big part of my sound. You yeah, know? he oh, really definitely. is. Yeah. He's you know a big part of, big part of who I am. Big part of what other people hear from me. Even on the songs he doesn't play on, actually, he's mm. still a big part of them. Um, the whole family are. My mum's still on the road and she sells all the merchandise on the road. And It must be a great joy for your parents to be able to work with you like that. Yeah, huh? they, they love it. But, I mean, it is, it's a great joy for me and my brother too, you sure. know, to get to experience that with them. And, and we, ha- we have a really great working relationship. Don't get me wrong, we have our moments. We have some pretty big oh, blues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yelling at each other. Nash and I had one last week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, um, you know, we can really get a rise out of each other. But, yeah. but you know, that's all, that's all part of it. We're passionate about what we do and I wouldn't change any of it. You know, I love working with my family. I couldn't imagine not having my family involved in what I do. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. So you make the record with your brother. Was it a, uh, do you feel like it was a laborious process because you were both trying to learn how to do it? Was it effortless? How did it go? It was 
pretty effortless. I reckon, um, you know, we, we had some moments in the studio where we didn't agree and things like that. But, you know, I think I was really lucky really early on before I made The Captain. I We, we started, um, my brother was my manager as well at mm-hmm. the time and he, and he still is. <laughs> he still is? Yeah, he still is, oh still God. my manager. And he, um, we, we were trying to get a, a record deal and we were, you know, going and talking to a bunch of, different labels you know and for the most part we were going and meeting with you know some person way down in the in the you know (laughs) in the record label in the ranks exactly um but then when we met with the guy from EMI records he um was the head guy of the label and he left a message on an, an, an answering machine of ours for the whole family and just said hey I heard what you guys do um, I'm a fan and I'd love to work with you somehow. And we're like, oh, wow, that's a nice thing from the head of the label. And, you know, um, and at, at this stage we hadn't really gotten a whole lot of phone calls back from anyone else. I know <laughs> the feeling, Casey. I know it. Yeah, yeah, we tried, <laughs> not from lack of trying. Um, and this guy just seemed to kind of speak our language, you know, and – he, um, we, we had a meeting with him and I remember a really, really early meeting that we had with him and, and I said to him, so where do you see my music sitting? Like what, where in the industry, you know, what, what sort of music do you see? What sort of audience do you see? What sort of album do you see for me? And he said, how about you just go away and make me the best possible record that you can and then I will create an audience for you. We are going to make our own audience for you. That is not a particular genre or anything. And he said, look, I'll be realistic. This may take me two years. It may take me 25 years to do this. But that is what I want to do for you. I just want you to do what you do. That's what I love about it. And that's what drew me in in the first place. And no one had really spoken to us like that Ooh. before. No one really speaks to many people like that. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, particularly the head of a label. Mm. And we were like, wow, this is, this is crazy. And, and how old were you when he told you? I that? was about 21. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I had made these. Uh, this is before the Captain album. Right. Um, but I was sort of ready to make the album at that mm-hmm. point. And then, you know, I mean, he... His name's Tony Harlow and he signed us there to EMI Records and has been, outside of my family, I think the most integral part of my whole career. And one of my best friends, beautiful human. Now we are um, uh, with Warner Music here in Australia. Mm-hmm. He heads Warner Music now. <laughs> which is, right on. So, so I'm still working with him and I still call him once a week to ask his advice about something or, or you know. This, that or the other. Yeah, yeah, or to pour my heart out about something, you know. And yeah. he's just one of my favourite people and has always just allowed us to be ourselves, you know, and, and allowed us to make mistakes as well. Like, sure. you know, he, he gives us advice and sometimes I go back and I go, oh, I should have taken that advice, you know. Right. But he's right there with us when we fuck up and, you know, yeah. and we move on and, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But he's a true friend outside of even just being a part of my career. What a rare thing indeed. It really is. What a it's rare thing rare. indeed. Yeah, In 2008, Casey was touring the U.S. behind a new album. The opener on that tour was Justin Towns Earl, who was playing solo and working hard towards the popular breakthrough he would have in the following couple years. As chance would have it, though, he was for some reason unable to play the Chicago leg of the tour, so they had to offer the show to some local open micer. And that was me. That year, I had just released my first EP and was starting to break out of the open mic circuit. Getting the call to open that show for Casey at Park West, a legendary venue in Chicago, felt like finally getting called up from AAA ball. I arrived at the venue and Casey came out into the hall to listen to my sound check. She took the time to meet me, listen to my tunes, give me some words of encouragement, And that sounds like normal, decent behavior, but 
Considering that she was a star in her home country to the point where she couldn't walk down the street without being recognized, I'm here to tell you that is very out of the ordinary, how welcoming and kind and generous with her time uh, she was to a guy who she had never met before and who it would have been reasonable to assume at the time she would never meet again. How a person acts when they've achieved great success I think is really instructive. You see a person's true colors when they possess the power to act upon them. I've kept up with Casey ever since, not just because I love her music, but also because it feels good to surround yourself with friends whose true colors, when you can see them, are so bright. Very well, when did you know that you had... um I hit an album on your hands. When did it, like, can you give me the moment that it dawned on you? Did you hear the song on the radio? Did a certain number of people show up at a particular show? When did you know that you had something that connected? Um, you know, it, it's all a little bit of a blur. Sure. I must admit, because it was, like, I, I was really naive, mm-hmm. really, really naive. But I was also fairly sure of myself about what I was doing, mm. as in, I w- even though I was really naive, it wasn't easy to talk me into things either, I- if they didn't feel right to me. And I'm still like that now, where I take in a lot of advice and I listen to everybody, but if it doesn't feel right in yep. deep in my belly, you know, it- it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I'm not always right about it, <laughs> I know that. And, you know, you, you think back and you could have done things differently. But um, I- through the captain years, um, I it was this really weird ride where I don't think I really realised the success that they were creating. I really mm. didn't. And, I, and I, I'd always lived a very um, normal life too, as in um, I didn't go out to premieres and, and do celebrity type things or anything right. like that. And, I, th- you know, that stuff didn't really interest me. I was just really on tour as much as I could be and then writing songs when I wasn't on tour and trying to concentrate on that. So I think it wasn't until the next album, till Barricades mm-hmm. and Brick Walls, you know, and until Not Pretty Enough, you know, ended up at n- number one on the pop charts and the album on number one on the pop charts yeah. at the same time that I started going, okay, all right, maybe this, you know. This I do remember thing. like, you know, sitting down and seeing, uh, watching Wheel of Fortune, which I did most nights, and then um, my uh, my partner at the time, who is um, my eldest son's dad, we were sitting down and we watched it every night together. And then he goes, it's, it's Casey Chambers, not pretty enough. And I'm going, don't be ridiculous. That's not on Wheel of Fortune, no. And he's going, it is. I'm telling you, that's what it is. And I would not believe it until they turned all the letters around. And then it was Casey Chambers, not pretty enough. And I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. This is like the most surreal thing ever. <laughs> I still think that's weird, you know. Yeah. God, good thing yeah. you weren't stoned when it happened. <laughs> <laughs> it was very strange. I mean, it was a very strange time in my life too because for the most part I was living, I wasn't really living the life of what um, I think what my career looked like I was, right. you know, yeah. where I was all over the radio and the TV and, and all of that. Um, I do remember coming back from a trip to America and having that, oh, all of a sudden, I walk down the street and people know who I am and that was really strange. Really? Yeah, that was a very, you know, I had never really had that much before, but that was around the time that I... Um, so, and that happened, like you had gone to America to tour and you came back yeah. and you were like, oh, a, a switch kind of flipped here. <laughs> it was very, yeah. it was very, very strange. It was, you know, um, and I mean, I fell pregnant with my first child when, um, uh, well, I was six months pregnant with Talon Uh when my song Not Pretty Enough was number one all over the country on the pop charts. So that was surreal in itself because all of this was going on and I was at home a lot of it. I mean, I was still touring, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't, I probably wasn't out. A lot of it was momentum. It was going on without me. And then 
Um, you know, the, the label were really lovely about the fact that I needed time to rest as well because he's yeah. this pregnant woman. <laughs> yeah, it's such a, in some ways, such a private process. Yeah. I guess this was your analogue to uh, you at three months old being taken out into the outback. <laughs> so this is your, your analogue to go along with it, huh? Exactly. I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to one-up them on <laughs> yeah. this one. And go- <laughs> past, past this prologue on that one. It was strange. <laughs> um, when you have that sort of success, you're kind of afforded the opportunity, if you want it, to kind of reach out to people that you love and admire. Did you ever take that opportunity when you first got it to reach out to people who had inspired you at that point? Oh, or? absolutely. Um, yeah. I, you know, I mean, you put it so nicely um, to reach out to people you admire. I used it <laughs> to meet yeah. famous people, yeah. pretty much, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that I could then name drop them. <laughs> Hell yeah, right on. No, it was, I mean, I felt very lucky early on to even, even before the, the mainstream success to have um, people like Paul Kelly or Steve Earle, Buddy Miller, Julie Miller, people like that who I had admired mm. a lot, Lucinda, um, who were, you know, giving me a shot with with stuff, you know, and and getting me to sing on things with them, and yeah. um, or just even word of mouth, just talking about the record and things like that. Buddy and Julie came in and played on on the Captain album, so that that was a huge thrill in itself, um, and and just lovely to have people like that who obviously that was before. Um, I had had any success here in Australia right. at all. And then to get people like them who are willing to come in and play on the record is just their dream dream come true for me. Yeah. There is nothing quite like um, an unsolicited compliment from somebody that you admire. I mean, it's just those are things that you can hold on to for privately for a lifetime. It's you know really I mean? beautiful and it's something that I've, I've always thought about with songs, you know, when, when you finish a song and you, and you sit back and go, um, you know, could you sit down in a room with the person that you admire, you know, musically and could you play them that song? Now, you know, sometimes I look back on all the songs I've put on records and think, well, I, no, I wouldn't now. But, <laughs> but at the time, right. I think I would have. <laughs> you know, I do something similar sometimes. I um, I'll, like, kind of meditate on or I'll, I'll think about like a song circle of people around and I'll think about it, I'll imagine that it's in a specific hotel or a place and there's specific people sit, sitting around and I'll imagine playing a song that really affects them and then I'll kind of think about what the vibe of that song is and then I'll write that song. You know oh, what I mean? Wow. Uh, oh, wow. Now, but like you said, it I doesn't it. always... I love it. No, you, no, it doesn't always pan live out forever, to, does it? <laughs> and, and, and usually, I mean, you know, 99 out of 100 don't, but... Um, <laughs> It is a way to kind of inspire yourself. It, to kind it of, is, yeah. And yeah. I'll look, nothing inspires me more than other music, other people's yeah. music. It, it's just, it always has been, you know, that I get, you know, just caught up in one record. And, and I am really that person too where once yeah. I get on one record, don't play me anything else for six months because yeah. that is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me and, yeah. I, and I don't want to hear anyone else. No, you know? seriously. But it does really inspire me a whole lot to write. I'll even do stuff where, and I... I should know not to do this because I hate it when people do it to me, but if I love an album by someone and then they come out with another one, I'm just kind of like, yeah, I'm not going to listen to that one yet because no. I'm, still, <laughs> I'm still into this one. Have you ever heard, do you know that, uh, do you know Willis Allen Ramsey? I know that name. So he's a Texas yeah. guy and he's only ever put out one album ever. It was 30 years ago. That's why I know of that name. Yeah. Because someone told me that he's that guy. Yeah, so and when, when people request, yeah. uh, like it shows, it'll be like, Willis, when's the next one coming out? He'll say... What was wrong with the first one? <laughs> <laughs> well, if we all made a record that good, it was, it, we That's probably it. would just That's sit it. on that one. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I gotta keep, but I yeah, gotta keep going because I get sick of the last one, and I'm like, oh, it's not quite as good as I thought it was at the time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, but no, sometimes I'm, I'm feasting on someone's work, and I just need to, uh, like, I'm not ready to move on yeah. with them yet. I need yeah. to keep on, uh, yeah, living in that place. Um, man, it's funny. And you, you toured, speaking of reaching out to people at that time, you even toured with Lucinda in the States. I did. Huh? And that was, I mean, that was a dream come true. Like yeah. We had five weeks on the road opening up for Lucinda all over America. 
Wow. We had a tour bus. I just thought that was the greatest thing that had ever happened because we wow. don't even have tour buses here at all. Yeah, because everyone flies from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or, you know, you get in a car and drive, but you stay in the town that you play in that mm-hmm. night. And then, you know, here we are and we're – I was just like, this is amazing. I, I remember the first day of that tour and I'm just sitting on my tour bus and I'm going, this is – I am literally living the dream. I am about to embark on this tour, opening up for my favourite artist, my biggest influence of my whole life. And then I get this knock on the on the um, tour bus door and I go and open it and it's Lucinda Williams. She's standing there and she just says, she did not say hello or anything, she just goes, can I borrow some nail polish remover? <laughs> and I'm like, I, I just stood there and I must have just stared at her for a minute and I just went, this is the single greatest moment of my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Freeze it. I Freeze love it right it. there. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. But, uh, you know, it was beautiful getting uh, getting to hear her every night. I got five weeks' worth of free tickets to see Lucinda Williams. Oh, Boom. Man. That was awesome. And just to play to her audience was, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I, or, I would walk out there every night and just think I already have so much in common with all you people because I'm as big a fan and I'm going to be down there in a minute watching. Yes. And it was just, it, it was amazing. They were incredible audiences to play to. They are. And I think that's maybe something that music listeners don't always realize is that different artists have um, different audiences. Uh, I don't want to say of different caliber. One's not better than the other, but they'll have audiences that are more open yeah. than other ones. Yeah. And, uh, so you want to go open for an artist that has like a real music oh listener God. crowd. Obviously, um, that would be the case with Lucinda. So that I don't was... know if you've ever um, opened for um, Robert L. Keen. I haven't. No. Oh, my God. He's like his audience. I opened this tour for him like it was not long after Lucinda actually. And I was so excited because I'd done this tour with Lucinda. I'm like, wow, I'm opening for this amazing singer-songwriter, you know, and and audiences in America are incredible and blah, blah. I didn't know that he had this real young college audience, Mm -hmm. which is about as far from my fan base as you can possibly get. And we started down south with him. And I remember us playing in New Orleans, opening up for Robert L. Keen, and it was Mardi Gras time. Oh, God. And they were throwing things at us. Like, honestly, <laughs> I felt like I was in the Blues Brothers. <laughs> they just hated us. It was God. like I was, it was a real eye-opener. Yeah. And then we, I remember getting like about two-thirds of the way into the tour and a lot of every, – every gig down south was like that. People Like, I, I remember for a whole song of mine – the whole audience chanting, Robert Earl King, oh, Robert God. Earl King. And I was like, man, if this is not making us stronger, nothing will. This is great, you know. And then I got two-thirds of the way through and um, the band, Robert Robert's band, came to us and said, hey, you guys have lasted longer than any support act we've had. <laughs> <laughs> so you're doing great. And we're like, oh, okay, thanks. Glad to That's hear it. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, it was great. At the turn of the 20th century, 60% of America lived in rural areas. Today, it's just about 20%. Pair that with the cratering attendance of church over the last 50 years, and you have a picture of a country that is less agrarian and less religious than ever before. But you might not know that from the radio. The stories told by modern pop country are stridently out of step with that modern reality. Turn on your local iHeart radio station and you'll hear Dirt Road Anthem, followed by Jesus Take the Wheel. You'll hear Something About a Truck and What I Love About Sunday. You'll hear Big Green Tractors and Small Town USA. And look, I won't let myself off the hook here. The boutique... uh, alternative country music that I love traffics heavily in those same anachronisms, songs about 
corn whiskey, songs about stubborn mules, and so many songs about trains that they've spawned an entire subgenre of songs about there being too many songs about trains. I'm not sure why we insist on telling our own stories through a bygone context, through totems of lives that we suppose we should have led rather than the ones we're leading, as if they were more decent or more authentic. I don't buy that. I think any life lived forthrightly is by definition authentic. We don't need to name check some distant agrarian past to be real. In fact, that might be the surest way to not be real. It might be the equivalent of dressing up like Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader and dueling one another with plastic lightsabers. And that's why Casey's story is so compelling. Because that boilerplate country story is actually hers. She did grow up on the open plains. She did move itinerantly wherever the work led with her family. She did learn music around the campfire. She did drop out of school to follow a dream. That's her. And she wears it effortlessly. If we could be as comfortable in our own narrative as she is in hers, we'd be so much the richer in stories to tell. So, if you have, let's say, you have an album coming up or uh, you have occasion to write and you have a day set aside for writing, walk me through like what that day would look like if you're going to write or do you write in a more spontaneous way? Screaming kids. <laughs> screaming, <laughs> screaming children, number one. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I used to, years ago um, when I first started writing and, and even through a lot of the Captain Barricades Brick Walls and, well, pre-kids pretty much, mm. my writing style was very different. I had to be in a room by myself you know, it had to be quiet, you know, mm. and my life is fairly chaotic just in general. It always has <laughs> been and I love that. You know, I yeah. love noise. I don't – I can't even go to sleep without TV or music or something. You need that on. white noise. I need yeah. that, yeah. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, probably the years of falling asleep with, in a moving car my whole childhood. something to do with that, yeah. <laughs> and gunshots. Right, right, <laughs> That's what right, I heard right, every right night. <laughs> gunshots and whistling of foxes. <laughs> So it's sort of, I mean, it sounds like a strange thing to fall asleep to, but I think now silence is a strange thing <laughs> for me to fall mm. asleep to. I don't like silence at yeah. all. Um, which has worked good for me having three children because I don't really get silence no, very you often. Don't. I don't imagine you <laughs> no. do. Yeah. Um, but I used it, except for when it comes to writing. It's the only time I ever really like spending time on my own. I'm very, you know, sociable, <laughs> extroverted person. Yeah. So I love being around people all the time. I, I love my job because I get to just be around people constantly yes. and, mm-hmm. and that fills me up. But then when I have to write or want to write or need to write, mm-hmm. I would have to be in a room by myself and just shut everything out in the world. Then I had my first child and I was like, okay, if that is the case, I'm never going to write again for the rest of my life. So, <laughs> so I better <laughs> figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> Something's going to change here. Um, so I kind of just started like teaching myself, I guess, to write around the chaos. Um, I mean, it was still preferred and it is still preferred now even, you know, to sit Mm -hmm. in a room by myself. But if that's not the case or even if that starts a song, Mm -hmm. I can finish it while I'm making dinner and bathing that one over there and, you know, and look, it it certainly takes a little bit longer and, um, (laughs) you know, it, it doesn't always work. But if I'm in a song enough, it will just keep writing itself, you know, and I've just got to be there to help it along So the when way. you say you're in a song enough, that, that's kind of a mode where you're doing other things but that song keeps on, it, it's yeah. in your background and you're like, oh, I got the, I got the first line of the second yeah. verse now. Cause well, I, I look at a song like a hill hmm. and I, I know the moment when I'm at the top of the hill and it's the and it's the down slide and, and it's the kind of the easy part. Sometimes it's two lines in 
when you're up the top of the hill and it's all down the downslide from there, the easy part. Sometimes you're not at the top of the hill until two thirds of the way through the song. Sometimes you may not have one lyric. Sometimes y- yeah. you might not have all the melody yet or whatever. But there's still a moment and I feel like I know that moment. And sometimes that moment takes me three days mm-hmm. and sometimes that moment takes me ten minutes. It, but So when you hit that moment, is that when you say, i got to drop everything else because I'm at this moment? Or, or is that when you just say, I can leave this be now because I can just finish it like that? Uh, I don't like to leave them be. I don't like to come right. back because sometimes I don't find that headspace again. Mm. Um, but I can, after that moment has been, if I have to, I can keep writing around chaos. So I can be, you know, writing the song and, um, yeah, the kids have been at friends' place or something and, yeah. But if I'm over that top of the hill part yeah. and they come home, I know that I can still get there. If not, I may have to pick it up another day, you know. Yeah, it makes that idea. I, I had never thought of it that way before, but um, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I wonder how much that speaks to uh, how much of this we're writing subconsciously uh, oh. with stuff, you know. And I think it's particularly that way um, writing words married to melodies. Rather, I bet you, if you're a novelist, it's not quite the same. Or I bet you, if yeah. you're a journalist, yeah. it's not quite the same. But there's something about words being married to melody that um, it's always the stuff that you didn't really feel like you did yourself that comes off as the strongest yeah. and most totally. inspired. Totally, you know, you without, know. without a doubt. It, and this, I write a lot around sounds. So mm. I will sit there and I will – sometimes I, I come up with a line that I love and I write a whole song around it. But it's still around sounds and, and what, what – um, you know, what vowels might sound good in in that melody. Mm. And then the lyrics will come after I've figured out. So I will sing a whole song while I'm writing and come up with the whole melody. Sometimes I will sing it. I mean, you listen to my voice memos on my phone and they're ridiculous (laughs) because a lot of them don't even have a word, not even one word. It's just all sounds, but I sing it as though they are words. Mm. (laughs) So I'm very convincing. So you have the meter. Yeah, the yeah. the meter is there yeah. with that, yeah. just not the yeah, yeah. exactly. And I kind of like that. I've sort of learnt to do that over the years, um, more so than than the lyric. And then I find the lyric just automatically comes. But you know, there's certain songs that I do not even remember writing. I know that one minute they didn't exist, and then the next minute they did. My new single, "Ain't No Little Girl," is exactly that. And it's funny because I wrote that song a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. and I, fi- I just it just wrote itself, and I honestly I reckon it took like an hour and a half, and that God. was it, it was, and I I don't very often write a song that quickly, <laughs> and I just wrote it and went oh yeah that's a song that exists now, and then that I never played it again. I didn't show it to anyone. I didn't play it anywhere. I didn't play it live. Didn't think it would ever make a record or anything. And then I feel a little bit like without knowing it. And without sounding like rainbows and unicorns, that the song was writing me. And it's a very, um, I feel like I had, the song is kind of leading me to be able to personally get to a point where I can pull that song off. Mm. And it's a really, you know, it, it's a song based on getting to a, a new strength in your life and, and yeah. a new power as, as a woman. I turned 40 this year, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. and I'm a single mother of three working, yeah. you know. Yeah. Trying to hold it all together, failing sometimes, but yeah. for the most part, you know, um, getting shit done. Yeah. And I feel like that song exists because it needed <laughs> to drag me up to it, you know. Ah, and yeah. I got there and I and then I realised how strong the song was. And so mm-hmm. I started putting it in my set um, live to sing it and... I can honestly say it, I've never, ever played a new song that has connected with an audience like this song Isn't ever there? in my whole life, oh, over man. Not Pretty Enough or The Captain or any of them. And it it all of a sudden became like my little theme song and it's kind of like the glue that holds my no, whole next record together and the next record's a double album and that's the only song that appears on both of the albums. It's sort right of, on. you know, just it's like my little anthem, I yeah. guess, you know, that's just dragging me along, you know. And there's vulnerable points in the song too but there's a strength in there and I had um, 
I had uh, two nodules removed from my vocal cords last year. So I went oh. through this vocal surgery and I've had nodules for 20 Right. Years. <laughs> you They're know, part of your sound. Of, yeah. We all do, probably, yeah. you know, and you just learn to sing through them. But I got to a point where I just couldn't sing anymore. Mm-hmm. I think I was screaming at my children too much. Um, right. <laughs> and they're right. like, yeah, you're going to have to go in and get rid of these. Um, the nodules, not the children. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it depends what day. <laughs> um, and, then, and then I went in and I had this surgery and it changed my voice quite a bit. So mm. I... I still sound like me, I guess, but um, there's a new sort of depth and power in there that I hadn't had before and it actually changed my writing a little bit and then I felt like I was able to sing this song in a way that I couldn't have sung when I first wrote it. Yeah. Or I couldn't have written it ten years ago, you know. And from then on it sort of changed my writing a little bit, I think. That's The idea of having a song that is kind of like uh, your personal anthem for, for that moment, um, I think that those can connect a lot, and those are some songs that I've I've loved uh, the most. Have you? Um, did you listen to that first Father John Misty album? No, I don't. I it's great. And, and, and the first uh, song on that is uh, is an anthem he wrote in his life when he was trans transferring from one, uh, uh, you know, mode of life to the next. And it was kind of his anthem. And uh, of course, yeah. it's the one that, you know, you connect with as the listener. Exactly. The and I mean, as it should be, mm-hmm. you know, because the, I didn't know it at the time of writing it. To be honest, I didn't even know if I'd ever play that song to another person, mm. you know. And some songs straight away, I know, like when I've written it, I'm just you like, know I know this one's going to connect. Or no, whatever, I know? can set my watch to... I'm sure whenever I'm sure something is really going to connect with people, it's pure shit. <laughs> it's really bad. Like, so I can almost do like, you remember that thing on Seinfeld where George Costanza started doing the opposite with women yes. with his intuition? That's what I can kind of do with songs. And uh, That's awesome. What a great way to look at it. Yeah. yeah. All, all well, it worked for George, you know. He ends worked. up with a job at the Yankees. <laughs> with a pretty girl. Right. He ends up with Steinbrenner. <laughs> no, but I can set my watch to it. And then, Whenever I think uh, a song is super self-indulgent, people like that one. I yeah. Don't know. Well, I think, you know, it. We're, we are in the business of connection, you know. What we do is about connecting mm-hmm. with people. And sometimes you connect with a lot of people, sometimes you connect with one person. But it is still just all about connection. And what I've learned is um, the songs that, really connect with my audience are not about songs that are relatable in content. Mm. If they're relatable to me and they have a lot of me in them, Mm -hmm. might not even be about my life or whatever, but if they have a lot of me in them, I think people just warm to that. You know, Mm. people can feel the connection that you have with the song, so then they feel the connection to the song as well. And they want to come along and they want to learn about that to a certain degree. Because I I do that as a listener. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, it, in some ways, uh, (laughs) well, it's stupid, but it, you know, like, um, it's kind of like a more sophisticated version of, uh, like how hard rock bands used to like start their albums out with like song number one, the song about how we're going to rock you tonight. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like just we're going to start out with that song like a declaration. And more people need to have like declar maybe more sophisticated. Like um, thank you so much for joining the show today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be part of it. It's oh, awesome. Right on. Thank you. That's our show for this month. Thanks for listening. Casey's latest album, Ain't No Little Girl, is available everywhere digital music is sold or streamed. Today's episode was engineered and mixed by Matt Schusler. Audio equipment was provided by Paulie B. Research and editorial direction provided by the intrepid and thorough Paul Barbagallo. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember... An expensive pair of jeans is not a song. A compelling Instagram account is not a song. And most importantly, 
Reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself. And for you, just keep your eye on the song.